I ask you all to rise, please. occasion that brings us together, but yet in all of it, there is hope. And those of us who have professed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can gain that hope through him today. My name is Pastor Rick Foster, and it's an honor for me to stand before you and with you today. Mavis, Vanessa, Carissa, and to lead this service for Kevin. The Bible tells us that there is a time for everything under the sun, a purpose for every activity, and to be born. As we spend this next whatever hour together today, I pray that God's Holy Spirit will minister comfort to our hearts. So let's bow together in a word of prayer as we begin today. Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to gather here today. We thank you that we are able to share in life and memory today of Kevin Green. We thank you for the privilege of knowing him, working alongside of him, claiming him as Mavis does for a husband. Vanessa and Carissa for their father. For David, claimed him as a father in law and for two grandchildren. He said to Gwendolyn, his grandpa. Father, we pray especially for these who mourn today, that your Holy Spirit would bring comfort to each and every heart for the role that Kevin played in our lives is different for each one of us but we thank you that we knew him that we were able to serve alongside of him and we thank you for the faith that he had in Jesus Christ and Lord we desire that this service today might not only be a a good reflection of Kevin's life, but it will also be that which would honor and glorify the Lord Jesus, in whose name I ask these things. Amen. When you came in, you found uh, a sheet on your chairs today for a song. I'm going to call on Vanessa to come and lead us to that song today. Great as I think.
your eulogy with us to give us a little more of a picture of uh, <clears throat> Kevin's life. On behalf of the Green family, I would like to express a heartfelt thank you to everyone for joining us and being part of today's funeral to celebrate Kevin's life, whether in person or virtually, virtually via live stream. My name is Randy Dalbert, and I've been a friend of Kevin for over 40 years. I'd like to start by sharing an overview of Kevin's life and then some of my own memories of him. Kevin was born on June 18, 1958, in Garter Grove, California, the second son for parents Gordon and Terry Green. Kevin took accordion lessons when he was young and also played the piano. He tried playing soccer during his public school days, and even though his asthma sometimes got the best of him, which is one of the reasons why his family moved from California to Ontario, he was an awesome soccer player. At Winona High School, Kevin played basketball, and in his senior year, he coached the Great Nines. <clears throat> After graduating from high school in 1976, Kevin was accepted into Algonquin College, where he graduated from the Structural Engineer Program. After moving to Edmonton, he eventually accepted a job with ADCO Electric, where he worked for 34 years. At ADCO, he worked as a draft person three on various transmission projects and went upon a retirement in on June 27th, 2015. He had worked in the GIS Mountain Group. Kevin married Mavis on June 9th, 1985, and were parents to two wonderful daughters, Vanessa and Carissa. Kevin's passion for woodworking, <clears throat> sorry. Kevin's passion for woodworking, and he, he enjoyed using his uh, scroll saw to create intricate art. He was very actively involved in his church and loved to volunteer. Since retiring, Kevin and Mavis have enjoyed traveling to various countries. As for my own memories of Kevin, I first met Kevin at Central Baptist Church through the church's call and career functions. We participated in many activities such as Bible studies, going out for coffee and hiking trips. We enjoyed each other's company. For a time, Kevin was part of a, sorry. One of my favorite memories I have of Kevin was when he uh, mentioned he was involved with uncles at large with a young boy named Richard. I was impressed with his concern and compassion and that he so willingly gave of his free time. He offered this young boy a positive male role model through mentoring and friendly support. Kevin kept in touch with Richard for many years. In 1982, Kevin invited me to Perry Sound, Ontario for Christmas. I enjoyed meeting his family and the hospitality they showed me. Kevin and I went on a short road trip to Hamilton, Niagara Falls, and Buffalo, New York. I remember when we first arrived in Buffalo, it was early in the morning, we took a wrong turn, ended up in a really rough area, something we'd never seen before. There was broken glass everywhere we looked. And as we were driving, uh, two men suddenly came running out of the house towards us, and we really panicked. Fortunately, to our relief, it just turned out they were going to their car. <laughs> Two years later, in 1984, while out in the parking lot of his apartment, Kevin noticed a beautiful young lady that he had met at Central Baptist Church. I'm sure Kevin made some excuse to go and talk to Mavis, or was it Mavis that needed some assistance with her car? Either way, they were smitten and were married on November 9, 1985, in Swan River, Manitoba. It wasn't too long before both of us became fathers to our firstborn daughters. I think that's when the woodworking bug hit Kevin. We did our first building project, making a doll's crib for each of our little girls. 
He was the ancient uh, circular saw, jigsaw, electric drill, hammer, and nails. We worked in a dimly lit garage, but we were sure excited about our project. The finished doll cribs looked great, and we were definitely proud of them. Kevin was quite enthusiastic and wanted to do more projects. I did one more, and well, Kevin, he did a few more, a lot more, and more. He developed great skill in working with wood, creating amazing works of art using the scroll saw. Recently, I was looking at a wedding gift that he and Mavis escaped during his daughter and his son-in-law. It was a trivet, which they kept on their, on their kitchen table. I held it in my hands, looking at the intricate detail and design. Completed perfectly. Kevin had amazing patience, perseverance, and obviously an advanced skill level. <clears throat> if you attended any of their craft sales, you would have known what it's talking about. For a time, Kevin was part of a woodworking group that decided to take on a major project to honor all of the fallen Canadian soldiers who fought and died in Afghanistan by scroll sign intricate silhouettes from photos provided by each soldier's family. Kevin was honored to be a part of this project and knew it truly touched each family who received these works of art. When we get together for coffee, Kevin often talked about furthering the kingdom of God by encouraging young people to be involved in missions. He served on the Global Missions Committee here at Elgley Baptist Church he assisted the youth pastor with youth mission trips to Mexico, <clears throat> first by being a driver, chaperone, and later helping organize the trips too. Here in, in Edmonton, he was all in getting senior high students to serve meals at the Hope Mission. He had a passion for the youth and mentioned his desire <clears throat> that in the future, some of these young men and women would have a passion for full-time mission work. Kevin also enjoyed ushering here at Elders and Baptist Church. He did this for 30 years. Although our lives got busy, and we didn't see each other uh, very often, always didn't see each other very often. We could always count on our annual uh, Valentine's dinner with Kevin and Mavis. It was always so good to catch up on what was going on in their lives. And we got to hear about their family and later also about their amazing trips that Kevin meticulously had planned. It's evident that this godly man had a rich life in service to the Lord, his family, friendships, and leisure activities. It's been an honor to share this with you this morning. And on behalf of myself and my wife, Betty, we want to express our help, heartfelt love and sympathy to you, mates and your family. God bless. Thank you. 
again, Vanessa. Now I'm going to call on one of Kevin's friends from Ellerslie here, um, Art Beatman, to share with us and lead us in the reading of God's Word. They asked me to read a passage of Scripture, but then they also I'm not sure how wise it was, but ask me if I'd say a few words. <laughs> so I actually only knew Kevin as a casual acquaintance at the church. You know, somebody you say hi to on Sunday morning, whatever, you know, then you just go on with life. Uh, but I, <clears throat> excuse me, I got to know Kevin on a, a, a mission trip to Dominican. Uh, and uh, on mission trips, you tend to spend hours and hours with people, uh, which was good. I quite enjoyed it. Uh, and it was there that I got to know his work ethic and his play ethic and his heart for helping others. So after Dominican, then we had uh, two more mission trips. Uh, these ones we got to take our wives on. Uh, one was to Haiti to work with God's littlest angels. And there as well, got to know his work ethic and his play ethic and his heart for helping others. The next one was to Italy where we went and worked with uh, Carmen Chug helping in the children's ministry there. And again, Kevin really had a heart to help others. Not sure if, how many of you know that Kevin is a detail person. So after the week of mission in Italy, we spent a week uh, holidaying with Kevin and Mavis around Italy. And we had got together before that, you know, to plan where are you going to stay, what are you going to do, and that type of thing. So about a week before we were going to leave, I got an email from Kevin that uh, told us what our flight numbers were, what our departure city and time was, when we were arriving, where we were arriving. Uh, after the week with Carmen, uh, it was listed where we were picking up the car, what the car was, where we were driving to, the name of the hotel, the address of the hotel, and the phone number of the hotel. 
So the whole week was fun like that. It was actually quite good. I quite enjoyed having my own personal travel agent. <laughs> Sometimes I think Kevin maybe spent almost as much time planning a trip as he did going on the trip. And it was quite enjoyed it. Uh, and as Randy mentioned, he also went on uh, trips to Mexico with the uh, Elders of the Youth from 2016 to 2019. I didn't get to go with him in 2016, but I did in 17, 18, and 19. Uh, and I don't know if anybody listening or here uh, was a parent or had a youth that went to Mexico, but I, I realized or remember in 2019, the handout that he gave to the parents was again detailed. Uh, it told them what time we were leaving Ellerslie, when we were arriving at the Alliance Church in Lethbridge, the address, the phone number, how long the drive was, what time we were leaving there the next morning, when we got to the U.S. border, when we got to Pocatello, how long the drive was, the name of the hotel, the address of the hotel, and the phone number. And the rest of the trip is planned like that as well. Parents didn't have any excuse for not knowing where their kids were going to be. And he really enjoyed building houses in Mexico. Uh, again, his, his heart to help other people. And the other thing he really enjoyed was after working on the house for the day, he get back to the compound, and he liked to go to the confectionery store and get a great soda pop. Quite enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. After that, or during that time, and, and, and we have holiday with Kevin and Mavis, uh, and we have really enjoyed uh, the time that we spent on vacations. Uh, and, and they were basically planned the same way. Uh, there was some time that wasn't planned, but for the most part, you knew what you were going to do and where you were going to go. And you knew all your flights, times, dates, locations, all of that information was always there. And we quite enjoyed that. So as well as holidaying uh, with them, uh, I also spent time with, with Kevin in Edmonton here. Uh, we went to football games. We did hikes. Uh, we went to, I was one of the people that was helping Kevin serve at Hope Mission, which he really enjoyed. And quite often going to football games, Kevin would, would say, like, why do you have season tickets? You don't cheer for the Eskimos, <laughs> which of course he did. And I said, well, one of the reasons is so that I can go and cheer for the other team because I don't like the Eskimos. <laughs> Anyways, really enjoyed spending time with Kevin. Now I'll do what I was asked to do. <laughs> Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord bless. Thank you, Art, for sharing your thoughts, memories, and the scriptures with us today. I had the privilege, even under COVID restrictions, to see Kevin cross and to pray with him and to share that same song with him as he lay there. Rissa, it's your turn. I apologize in advance in the prior, so we will try to get through this. Um, on behalf of Kevin Green's immediate family, my mom Mavis, my sister Vanessa, and her husband Dave, grandkids, and said, Why do I myself? We would like to thank each of you for taking the time to pay tribute to Kevin Green. While this is not the outcome we have been praying for, we trust the sovereign will of God. When he decided to call Kevin home on Tuesday, 
I would love to spend some time remembering who my dad was and the lasting memory he will leave on his family. Kevin was a remarkable husband. I have many, many memories of how much my dad loved my mom. As the Lord calls all men in Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Dad was a daily reminder of what true sacrifice and service means in a marriage. My mom has many fond memories of how Kevin would go above and beyond in service to her. When my mom asked for tulips outside her kitchen window to have a bit of color to look at when she washed the dishes, my dad didn't just plant a dozen tulips, as my mom expected. He actually planted 75. <laughs> but that was my dad. He wanted to make my mom happy. If he wasn't planting tulips, he was being a dedicated sous chef for my mom in all the cooking she did. My dad would sit for the island at the island and cut anything my, um, my mom asked so that she would have one less thing to do. It didn't stop there. My dad was my mom's personal IT department answering any time she called, even while he was at work, so that he could help her with anything computer or tech related. He really loved being able to provide for my mom and be of assistance any way she needed. Now, he was of great assistance, but thank goodness he was also patient, especially when my mom tried to help with things and ended up creating more work. Some, something about trying to help my dad with gardening and accidentally digging up all the flowers he just planted. My dad loved doing the outdoor work and took great pride in his lawn and his flower beds. I think it was mostly because he wanted my mom, he didn't want my mom to ever cut the grass or do any yard work, but I know it's also because he knew that fresh flowers made my mom smile. Kevin was also a remarkable father-in-law. Dave would have loved to be here today, but dad's last request was for Dave to take care of his sweeties, his grandchildren. So he is at home with the grandchildren today in honoring dad's last wishes. Dave met his father-in-law 14 years ago. Vanessa and Dave were dating at the time and she wanted Dave to meet her parents. So they agreed to go to Kevin and Mavis's house where Vanessa would introduce everyone. Needless to say, Vanessa was a bit late. <laughs> As it turns out, Mavis was also late. <laughs> this was before phones, so Dave went to the front door and he knocked to say hello to Vanessa and have her introduce him to her parents. But it was just Kevin there <laughs> for the next hour. <laughs> Dave was later asked if that meeting was awkward at all, and the answer is no. They got along well enough and Dave learned where Kevin was from, how he came to Edmonton, and what he did. They talked squirrel saw and sports. It was perfectly normal. Sometimes they'd have tiny disagreements over details like how tall to build a workbench <laughs> or how best to drive a car onto ramps for an oil change. <laughs> Those were the exception. Most of the time, they just happily worked on construction projects together or went to hockey games or barbecued. When Dave became the father of two girls, little changed. They just switched from building workbenches to building swing sets. Dave never was close with his own father, so the normalcy and ease of his relationship with Kevin was always something very precious to Dave. Dave was, Kevin was also a remarkable dad. Vanessa and I have so many memories of dad, and we both agree that dad was dependable, and we knew we could count on him. Vanessa remembers that hours after the birth of her second daughter, she had to call dad and ask him to drive her husband, Dave, to the hospital at 3.30 a.m. because he was vomiting and he couldn't stop. <laughs> dad drove him there, helped him out, and then took Dave back to his house to sleep while Vanessa cared for their newborn daughter. Later, when Dave was still unwell, dad came with mom to Vanessa's house and helped by getting groceries and proceeding to clean every single inch of the house so that the contagious gastrointestinal bug didn't spread to Vanessa or his granddaughters. Cold calling someone at 3.30 a.m. is a big deal. But Vanessa knew that dad would help her out. Dad could always be counted on to drive us places, help us with homework, share his passion of woodworking, especially when Vanessa signed up for construction in junior high. Attended all our sports games, attended weekend tournaments, helped Vanessa move residences more times than she can remember in young adulthood. 
teach car maintenance basics, help run over current house, help build swing set for the granddaughters, and the list goes on. I personally have so many memories of my dad. And when some of my friends found out he passed, they all astoundingly said, your dad loved you very much. He would do anything for you. And they were certainly right. No matter how dumb my plan, my dad would support me. This was most apparent when I decided I wanted to move to BC and live in Vancouver. At that time, it sounded like a great idea, but as the move progressed, I knew I was in some deep water. The family vehicle, a 1994 Ford Aerostar van, flew its engine in the mountains. Now, I expected my dad to be mad, but instead he took compassion on his youngest daughter moving out on her own for the first time. We went to the truck halfway through our journey and eventually made it to Vancouver, but not before we, pulled o we got pulled over for speeding. It had been a very emotional day, and my dad, not willing to get a stain on his perfect driving record, told me to cry, so the cop would give me a break. I'm proud to report it worked, and my dad got off with only a warning. We felt as if we were unstoppable partners in crime, and I will tell you that we high-fived as the cop drove away. But that's the thing. Father was moving me to Vancouver, helping me buy my first place. Replacing the brake pads and rotors on my car, tackling the list of home renos I often required. My dad always did anything for his baby girl. He told me no matter how old I got, I'd always be his baby. I realized as I've gotten older, <laughs> my dad grew with me. He still helped out in whatever I needed, just on a grander scale. It was no longer cuts and bruises, but rather how to navigate getting my first mortgage, <laughs> how to install a dishwasher, and how to set up a work from home office area. <laughs> he knew how to do it all, and he wanted to teach us. <sighs> Holding my dad's hand as he took his last breath on this earth was the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> And well, I could be devastated that I can no longer call my dad to tell him about how my day was or ask him for his advice when I'm definitely in over my head. I choose to be happy that my dad is finally in perfect fellowship with our Lord. His earthly body has been made new, and he will forever worship our Savior in heaven with all the saints. There is no way my family and I would have been able to get through the last few months without God's strength. This all happened very quickly. And I have to say that was a lot of bad news to handle in such a short period of time. But I'll tell you this, the Lord sustained us as a family and continues to be our source of strength. God went above and beyond answering our prayers in the last few days of Kevin's life. With the current COVID restrictions, we were only able to have two people visiting in the room at a time, which meant we were not allowed to be together as a family for his final moments. But thank you so much to everyone who fiercely prayed that God would provide a way for us to spend our last moments with dad as a family. On two separate occasions, we were able to all be in the room with dad, and we sang hymns as Vanessa played the guitar. This was very healing for our family, and I will forever be grateful for the way God provided for us in that moment. I read the Psalms to my dad on his last day, and besides Psalm 23, which we just read, and which he loved, Psalm 59 brought me to tears. Saul had sent men to kill David, and he cried out loud to the Lord in verse 16, but I will sing of your strength, I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. I want to leave you with this last quote from a book titled The Christian Pilgrim, written by Jonathan Edwards. The enjoyment of God is the only happiness 
with which our souls can be satisfied. To go to heaven fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, or children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows, but God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the fountain. These are but drops, but God is the ocean. We love you, Dad. We will certainly miss you. And we will think of you until we meet again. Thank you, Carissa, for that. I said to uh, Mavis and Carissa the other day as we were talking about the plans for today that um, I felt it was important that they could be involved, the girls could be involved as they were. Um, because I think there's a, that's an aspect of healing in the process of you being involved and uh, that the Lord has given you strength to do so. It's, it's amazing. <clears throat> Knowing the story behind something or someone often increases not only our understanding, but makes it or them more meaningful and appreciated. For instance, take a tool that our brother Kevin would have been very familiar with, given his hobby, and that which he and Mavis worked on together, a scroll saw. I certainly was not aware that the forerunner to what we know as a scroll saw <clears throat> was first patented in England in 1829. That's a 190 year history to a machine that is used for making fine, intricate cuts, mainly in wood giving an ornate look to everything from Christmas ornament to the gable end of a house and the scroll work that is seen on a facia sometimes. Masterful use of such a tool lends itself to the creation of beautiful works of art. And we know that Kevin was good at that. I want to say that I have certainly appreciated the stories shared today about Kevin's life. Although having known Mavis since Bible college, which was a few years ago, I did not get to know Kevin until we started our journey here with Ellerslie, which has not even yet been two years. And with so many new faces to get acquainted with, my time spent getting to know him was limited to basically a couple of visits at their house, and greeting him on Sunday at his usual post at the door to the sanctuary. So my thanks to each of you who has contributed to my understanding and appreciation of this brother in the Lord. Also, to Mavis, Vanessa, and Carissa, Thank you for sharing your husband and dad's life with us. I trust that for you, the reflecting and writing of his story, which you have done in these recent days, has given you a new understanding and appreciation. The man you call husband and father. 
such things help us in our time of sorrow and it reminds us that as people we are beautiful and unique works of art intricately formed by the hand of a masterful creator and because of him we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. Some of what the church staff and others have shared with me this past week bear a common thread. They all acknowledge Kevin's strong capabilities as an organizer and leader, and as someone with a servant's heart and a desire to honor our Lord. Also, as one who had submitted his life to Christ, he was concerned for others, both near and far. <clears throat> that they, too, might hear the good news of the gospel and come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. His participation with our church youth serving at Hope Mission, and I understand Mustard Seed as well in the time past, and his involvement with ERBC's missions team youth trips to Mexico are evidence of his concern for others that they might know the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. Concurrently, his involvement in these things also set an example for numerous young people within our church's ministry instilling in them the desire to love and to serve God by serving others. To those younger ones listening in who were influenced by Kevin's life, you can honor him and the Lord by continuing the example that you saw in his life. It was the Apostle Paul who said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, Kevin might not have been saying that to the youth of ERBC, but he was no less setting an example for all of us to follow. I want to focus our attention briefly today on another passage of scripture, which the Apostle Paul wrote the believers in Colossae. In his opening chapter to this short letter, he expresses his thanksgiving to God for their faith and advancement of the gospel, and he prays for them. Now, this prayer is one Kevin may have used for the youth that he administered to and with or for the global missions partners that he interceded for, or even for his own family. Such a prayer demonstrates the virtues of faith, hope, and love, and give evidence to the fruit of God's spirit in the life of the believer. Here in Colossians 1, Paul says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Now let me pause. Let me just say, what had Paul heard? Well, you have to go back to verse 4 of this chapter. He said he had heard of the faith of the Colossian believers and their love for all the saints. So that's what he's referring to. Let me start again. And so from the day we heard of your faith, and your love for all of the, the saints. We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, 
and the forgiveness of sins. In Paul's prayer for these Christians, he prays three things. One, that they might know God's will by being filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Second, to walk in God's will, bearing spiritual fruit in every good work that is pleasing to God. And thirdly, for strength, that they might patiently endure with joy. Dear Christian friends, living for Jesus, a life that is true, trying to please him in all that we do, it's not an easy task. It requires these things for which Paul prayed for these believers in Colossae. And so this should be a prayer that we pray for ourselves, our family, and for our Christian family. To know God's will, to walk in his will by the power of the Holy Spirit, and for strength to patiently endure with joy all that will come against us in this life. This is especially true now for Kevin's family and those who love him the most and will no, no doubt miss him the most. To finish his prayer, Paul reminds us of three other things. Three things that God has done. One, he has qualified them, us, to share in the inheritance of the saints. Secondly, he says he has delivered them, us, from the domain of darkness. And thirdly, he has transferred them, us into the kingdom of his son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. To be redeemed is to be bought back, which Christ did on the cross when through his death and his shed blood, he paid the price for our sin. We receive the forgiveness of sins when we confess our faith in Christ and put our trust in what Jesus did on the cross. We are then delivered from the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of light and made heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, Paul says in Romans, and now qualified to receive the inheritance of the saints, which is eternal life. Friends, our dear brother, Kevin, has gone on before us to receive that promised inheritance of eternal life that is offered to those who believe, who trust in Christ as their Savior. His faith has been made sight. His prayer of faith to receive the gift of God has been answered. He has passed from death unto life, where he now waits for us to join him in the resurrection to eternal life. Hear the words of Jesus, who admonishes his followers to be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. As Kevin was faithful, May his example inspire our desire to be faithful to the end of our days. Join me in prayer.
Heavenly Father, as we ponder the course of our own lives, having reflected today on the life that Kevin lived, cause us to consider the purpose and the plan that you have for each one of us. That we might know your will and walk in it with joy while we patiently endure all that yet lies before us. Help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face. To receive from him all that belongs to a child of God, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Amen.
you again, Vanessa. <clears throat> well, this brings to a conclusion our service here. I need to make just a few announcements before we depart. And uh, one of those is that um, <clears throat> there will be no vehicle processional to the cemetery today. Um, you will, uh, you can follow the funeral car if you can keep up with it. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> you have to make your own way there. And um, unfortunately, Government restrictions being what they are, they are there are only 10 allowed at the cemetery. You can have 20 here, you can only have 10. And I think those of you who know who you are that were invited, but the rest can come if they would like, you just have to stay in your vehicle. And lastly, um, you're welcome to pick up um, a bag just outside the doors here is a little lunch for you as uh, you make your way homeward or to the cemetery today. Let me, uh, let me pray. Gracious God in heaven, thank you for the privilege that has been ours today to share in this celebration of Kevin's life and what a celebration it has been. I believe it has truly both honored his life and you. And God, I pray that your spirit of comfort will continue to rest on each and every one, not only those gathered here, who are mourning his passing today, but those who are also watching or will be watching. Father, we thank you that you left your Holy Spirit to be a comforter to us because you knew the challenges and the difficulties and the things that we would come up against in this life. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went before us and that you have conquered death. That you give to us the hope of eternal life. Father, fill our hearts with that hope today as never before. Guide us as we make our way to the cemetery and for the graveside service that will be taking place there. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, I pray. Amen. Please stand. <laughs> Thank you. 